You are listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Here we have the opportunity to listen to the stories that connect our musical family tree. First-hand accounts of performances, musicians, and mentors that shape the way we listen, learn, and teach. On today's episode, we welcome retired principal oboist of the New York Philharmonic, Joe Robinson. For the Woodwind family, your stories are a goldmine of treasure. So I'd love to start at the beginning and talk about your formative school years and how you found the oboe. Like you, Erica, I grew up in North Carolina, but I was in a small town, about 8,000 people, nobody was sure, but the, its function was to produce wood furniture, and so Lenore, North Carolina, was one of the centers in the country of uh, doing that. And I think there were 16 furniture factories in my hometown. That's about all there was in my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> so one of, uh, I guess it started with a family uh, the Harper family, uh, for whom there were the streets were named and schools were named when I was a kid growing up there. Uh, actually, it's, there was a tremendous amount of uh, hardwood uh, trees, lumber that could be uh, harvested from around there, and the industry that had been in Michigan moved south to get away from labor unions. So, anyway, that's how furniture came to be in Lenore, and the grandson of a man who really started all that wanted to play the flute instead of run all of this family business. <laughs> and he came back from World War I with a commission, Captain Harper, and baffled everybody by buying the best instruments he could get so that he and fellow American legionnaires could learn to play. Wow. and hoping to march to their own music around the <laughs> Confederate monument on Armistice Day. Wow. <laughs> anyway, it was a disaster because, you know, it turned out to be much more difficult to learn to play these instruments than he had any idea. <laughs> and um, so after a few disastrous rehearsals, he gave the <laughs> instruments to the high school and created the Lenore High School Band, which could have been nothing if he hadn't spent the next 60 years sustaining it and investing his life and his family fortune Amazing. in this basically conservatory mm -hmm. that was attached to a public high school of about 450 kids. So my mother, who taught senior English in the high school, would look across the parking lot at this three-story brick building, band building, jealously because the kids who played in the band couldn't be working on this newspaper which she supervised or, <laughs> or, or doing any other extracurricular things but all of us had the best instruments in the world for free and get this there were five full-time faculty members and wow. who were well-trained musicians the the uh, brass teacher had been a solo cornet player in the Sousa band which was a big deal in the you know 30s and 40s in this country anyway he was a, a star and my woodwind teacher had studied clarinet with Ralph McLean, who was... Wow, that's he was, incredible. He was probably, yeah, I think he's still regarded as maybe the greatest clarinet player ever in I the feel, Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah, I feel if, like he was one of the, the founders of clarinet in America. Yeah. So, the, well, and as you know, it, it, there's a kind of filial piety involved in uh, developing instrumental skill, which is why it's still basically a matter of apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And it's important, ultimately, with whom you study mm -hmm. and in what tradition. But, you know, kids all over the country still, I would say it's as, it's happening as much as, as it did in my day or more, that they start playing an instrument and playing in groups with others and peers and whatever, whether it's Suzuki violin or or jazz groups, uh, they, they, they love it as much as we did. Mm -hmm. And they, in effect, just music has this power to communicate things and to stir emotions and one's imagination. And, and then finally, there's the athletic dimension mm -hmm. of playing more and more difficult, doing more and more difficult things and, and getting a kick out of it. Um, so, I, what was remarkable about my experience isn't that there was anything unusual about the people I 
grew up with. And even, it's just the program itself that made it possible for ordinary kids to discover extraordinary musical potential right. and express that. And so, you know, I made it to the New York Philharmonic, but there were, you know, contemporaries of mine who went to the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, who went to the Minnesota Orchestra, the, to the Dallas Symphony, and dozens who taught, became band directors, teachers, community players, who enriched their communities throughout their lives because they could play music and love doing it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But it was the band that was remarkable, and there were probably only a half dozen that could compete with it in the United States. So, right. you know, I, it was even, a, I would say, respectable to be oboe player in the Lenore High School band. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's not always the case. <laughs> By the time my oldest daughter took took up the instrument in New Jersey, she was embarrassed by it. And um, she it was a flag girl, you know, at intermission, I mean, halftime when they would march and right. she'd twirl that flag because she can't, <laughs> can't march with the elbow. So she'd come after in the second half and come sit in the stands with us and cry. So... And then I heard her play, actually, in a spring band concert and said, Katie, why don't you join the debate society? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the worst thing I ever did as her, as her father. Maybe, but, uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm kind of, I, I'm persuaded here in my old age that, that there is a kind of um, impulse to, to participate in music making that bubbles up mm-hmm. and is irrepressible. It happens all over the world in different traditions, of course, but there, there is also something about the Western classical tradition that I became persuaded traveling around the world with the New York Philharmonic is also irresistible. Mm-hmm. And it's been incorporated, uh, uh, taken in by almost every other cult, cult, country and culture in mm-hmm. the world. Yeah. So much that, as you know, I mean, Asian violinists are teaching us our own craft. Right, you know, right. They exported the Suzuki program. And uh, so I would say when an audition happens at the New York Philharmonic, first of all, the, the odds are that probably two-thirds of the winners are going to be Asian women. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when I went to New York in 1978, there were, I think, five women in the orchestra. Isn't that incredible? So that's another thing that's, you know, well, in general, the orchestra business is not uh, as healthy, thriving, growing as it was when I was a young adult. Mm-hmm. When I, I would say I bet my life on the culture boom right. in the mid-60s when Kennedy was in the White House and we created the National Endowment for the Arts, the Kennedy Center... Lincoln Center in New York City, Ford Foundation gave whatever sixty-six million dollars to American orchestras. That's a lot of money mm-hmm. in those days, mm-hmm. and it was a growth industry. Yep. So, <laughs> I was in my first year as a young professional when I got a call from the principal oboe of the Baltimore Symphony asking if I knew anyone who would be interested in second oboe in his orchestra. Oh my goodness! I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. No, I mean, now people are dying for people it. Absolutely. Trying to get the job, right? So wow. That that's... fact is discouraging, of course, to people who uh, confront it. Right. Um, and it's hard to believe that there was a time when there wasn't enough supply for the demand. Right. And so. I'm always fascinated by the stories where someone is brought in who maybe isn't totally ready, sometimes a son or a friend or a student, and they get to learn on the job and of course become a beautiful musician but they learned by doing and now you have to be rock solid and be ready to do it and with no experience sometimes well you know they just announced the new principal oboe of the chicago Symphony. Yep. with your 24 years mm-hmm. old mm-hmm. he's gonna have to learn on the job exactly and on in on the big stage you know, that's right yeah, yeah. Be, <laughs> well and you know uh, liz cook tishiani who plays with us here at the Bellingham Festival mm-hmm. of Music sometimes, and whose husband plays second trumpet, took the Atlanta Symphony principal oboe job, I think at age 20, wow. as did one of her predecessors, Elaine DuVos, mm-hmm. who came at the same age, 
left the Cleveland Institute a year early. So it happens. I, I played for 27 years with uh, Stanley Drucker, mm -hmm. who came to the New York Philharmonic age 19. Right. And, and he had left Curtis to start playing in the Indianapolis Symphony at age 16. So sometimes it does happen that someone's just, just raw talent is so uh, impressive. And, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, that can't, can't be thwarted or held back. Uh, so what is it about oboe that, that grabbed your attention? How did you decide that instrument? Oh, people ask me that all the time. And so I, in my book that I've just written called Long Winded, you know, I confess that it wasn't the oboe at all. It was a pretty girl. <laughs> <laughs> the other big furniture company in Illinois, the biggest, I guess, was Broyhill, which still can be yeah, found around absolutely. the country. Broyhill, well, there was a very pretty girl in that family, Linda Broyhill, <clears throat> who, well, she you know, attracted my attention at age 12. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of sitting next to me in study hall, which I thought I'd arranged very carefully, <laughs> she went across the way to the uh, junior high school band and took up the oboe. So this is the first time I ever heard of the oboe. Fascinating. I didn't know the oboe. I didn't well, realize oboe. that. Well, now, <laughs> I would say, well, of course, as you know, I retired in 2005, and it's uh, 13 years uh, free fall from those exalted days when I was so protected and privileged and everything. And it's been kind of a shock to discover that I would say half of the people I ever meet have no idea what the oboe is. Right. Isn't that fascinating? So I have an email address, you know, J Obo Rob, and people don't know what that oboe thing is in the middle. <laughs> I get the J Rob, but what? And so if I ask them, and uh, they have, you know, they're embarrassed a little. Sometimes they say it's that long thing that looks like a bedpost. <laughs> You're like, no, nope, that's a <laughs> That's the wrong one. It's a double read, right? No, I have to tell them, no, the oboe is an anorexic clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> then they kind of get the picture. I oh, think. my gosh. So, but anyway, you think I find a little dismaying to realize I've devoted my life to such an esoteric thing that uh, half the people in I encounter don't even know what it is. Can't identify and it. And I would say after all these years, since 2001, 17 years already, uh, being in Bellingham and uh, so happy to participate in a really remarkable music festival in one mm. of the most beautiful places in America. It's very privileged to be here, I think, as we all are. Absolutely. Uh, it's... Uh, it's still surprising and disappointing to me that half the people I meet in Bellingham still never heard of the festival. I know, yeah. And we hang a banner across the street, home, yeah. right, in, yep. in several places, saying, oh, the festival's happening. Okay. So that's a curious disconnect. It is interesting. You know, what happens, actually, as did last night on stage at here at the University of Western Washington, is quite an amazing high-octane musical experience i would say it really was very close to the highest level with some of the greatest people who pursue classical music and this cellist we heard last night did incredible proves that virtuosity is ir you know will always yep. be uh irresistible, it's irresistible. Yeah. yeah the audience literally jumped immediate. Left to their feet yep and it, it's i feel like that experience he did such a beautiful job but um having an audience be so captivated and mm -hmm. having the person who is in control of the situation be so in control and be able to manipulate and move the audience and they hold their breath and they just lean on the edge of their seat and for that moment everybody in the room is together everybody in the room is focused no one's daydreaming everyone's right there and 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 everyone gets to feel that experience then when it ends the emotion is through the roof and everyone jumped up and everybody was present and I feel like music is one of those things that can captivate everyone you can hear a pin drop and everyone's right there well and you know it can happen in several dimensions in the in the case of uh, the cello soloist last night this young man from Armenia. Armenia, right. Mm -hmm. Who played as an encore some folk music. He mm -hmm. might have written that himself. He actually sang as he played, mm -hmm. running up and down the, the uh, 
the uh, you know cello and yeah. incredible speed. <laughs> you know, well, that that the perception that was so thrilling to the audience is not so different from the perception of watching the someone win the gold medal in the Olympics. Exactly. Yeah, you're seeing an incredible feat. Yeah, done and, perfectly, and, so, and it's so astounding. So human virtuosity in any field can yeah. be dazzling and amazing, and will always be compelling. Mm-hmm. And I think because it demonstrates that our what we think are limits mm-hmm. on our human potential continually are, are, are broken, being pushed. changed, yeah. and and expanded. So that that happened, and and I think in that dimension. To the extent that the festival brings in young people, like especially young people like mm-hmm. that, um, incredible talents. It, it, it's thrilling to the audience, and who, mm-hmm. and the people who come are don't forget it. They talk about it. They will come next year, but that's only one dimension. There's there's another in which a uh, hundred well, there were 106 members of the New York Philharmonic, who at on a good night, on their best night played with such amazing uh, teamwork, mm-hmm. a collaborative effort, that sometimes it could also be take your breath away mm-hmm. just to hear a chorale tune played so beautifully mm-hmm. that you can't imagine that, that those instruments would be that perfectly in tune, traveling across through time with the same sort of arc mm-hmm. and with such emotional effect. Mm-hmm. So... Sometimes what we call like legitimate classical music it can be spellbinding mm-hmm. as much as somebody who can just uh, do quadruple somersaults right. on, yeah. a, on a clarinet. I you totally know? agree. So it, it, there are two, I think at least those two dimensions. Music has its own, its, its own power, which I think cannot be, cannot be uh, diminished or suppressed. It's going to express itself one way or another. Mm-hmm. And often it's only a matter of experience and familiarity that's needed to open, to unlock the potential of the kind of rewarding musical experience that the initiated believe mm-hmm. is one of the most wonderful things in all of life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there are many people, as you said earlier, Erica, who are kind of put off or intimidated, mm-hmm. or they think, Eh, it's some kind of highbrow thing that cannot be for them. And I don't think, in my experience, uh, the Lenore High School band where, you know, we're just a bunch of rednecks in the, in, in the woods, kind of, yeah. uh, who found within ourselves this kind of passion and potential that nobody there except Captain Harper believed existed. Right, you know? exactly. So... Uh, Anyway, I, I continue to think that I gave my life to important stuff and that I took chances you have mm-hmm. and you know, in terms of career building and all of that. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel that I served an important, um, well, you could almost say master in terms of there being the potential in art for the discovery of truth mm-hmm. and truth about the human condition and about what matters the most in life. Yes. So I want to jump ahead and then we'll go back because the concert last night is a perfect example. One question that I like to ask everybody is what was a performance that sticks in your mind that you participated in that had that kind of high octane potency where the piece ended and you could feel the room? And then was there a performance that you were able to be at and that really stick in your mind throughout your career where you, you felt the magic, it was there, everyone who was playing felt it and, it, and it left an impression on you as you continued on your journey. People ask me that question, but usually in the context of what do you remember from the New York Philharmonic? Well, I played about surely more than 3,000 concerts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and fortunately with the, the, some of the best, most highly regarded musicians in the, in the world. Um, of course, it's, as you know, it's impossible to sustain 100% emotional commitment, con- concentration. Uh, you know, most of the time, even at that level, I would feel that I left a few dead soldiers under my chair. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, didn't get it all. 
In fact, you know, so going through a piece like uh, you played Dafton Scloy Suite last night, it's incredible. There's you notes know, everywhere. I mean, a million notes, right? Yeah. Well, did you miss any? Probably, <laughs> but it was <laughs> still a blast. To, you don't have to confess. <laughs> well, fortunately, not everybody uh, can hear them all. <laughs> so there, there, there is that. But anyway, I, I would say it's very it's difficult because I, I got to, to have mountaintop musical experiences Absolutely. in a rarefied. I mean, you know, Mount uh, Everest or something. You're yeah. up there where there's so the oxygen is thin. Yeah. You know, but that was the great greatest privilege of my experience. But if I had to choose one, I would probably say it was uh, concerts, four of them, performances of Mahler's Second Symphony, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Wow, that's one of my favorite pieces. Now, Bernstein had come out of, uh, well, he was supposed to be composing, and he, the, <laughs> the muse, the muse was not with him. <clears throat> so when the German conductor, Klaus Tinstedt, had to cancel because of uh, illness, uh, the management Ask Lenny, Leonard Bernstein, we called him Lenny, Lenny to come, please come rescue the situation and conduct. And he said he would do it if he could do Mahler's second. Now, Mahler, Gustav Mahler was the music director of the New York Philharmonic beginning in about, I think, 1905. Mm -hmm. And Bernstein, 50 years later, popularized Mahler's symphonies by right. recording them and championing them. At, and... Uh, for orchestra musicians, particularly, I would say many of us would say that Mahler is certainly one of their favorite composers. Absolutely. Because his, his aspiration as a composer was a lot like Beethoven's in the sense of trying to be uh, encyclopedic, mm -hmm. to encompass, express in, in music just as much of the human experience as he could imagine, and in different modes. Each symphony is a little bit different. <clears throat> and in the second, he was at a stage of his life, a Jewish composer who converted to Catholicism. Right. And there's a lot of discussion about it. Did he mean it or not? Right. How, uh, and I think in the time he wrote this piece, he meant it. Mm -hmm. He meant it. And so it's called the Resurrection Symphony. It's the first major work written after Bernd, uh, Beethoven's Ninth, Right. that uses a giant chorus. Mm -hmm. Now, you probably know, in the first movement of the piece, which he wrote fairly quickly, uh, it's very uh, very dramatic music, kind of athletic, I'd say, sort of young in life, and and uh, he played that. Anyway, Mahler played, played that at the piano, in a reduction at the piano for uh, the most important conductor in Europe at the time, uh, Hans von Bülow. Mm -hmm. you know, von Bülow's opinion meant a great deal. And at the end of that demonstration of the first movement of this piece, von Bülow got up and said, if this is music, I don't know anything about music, and walked out of the room. Wow. So it's, it's a devastating to right. Mahler. His first symphony had already been performed and was successful, but of course this is the new one. And eight years later, Mahler, Gustav Mahler, was, I think, in Hamburg at the funeral of von Bülow. And for those eight years, he'd been struggling with uh, whether it was worth it even uh, to complete this piece that von Bülow had scorned. And, but, but he'd been steadily working on it, but he couldn't find a way. He wanted to use this chorus uh, as Beethoven had. This was intimidating, of course. Mm -hmm. He couldn't find the right text. But at von Bülow's funeral, this Klopstock ode was sung by a choir in the <laughs> balcony behind him. I did not know that. Yeah, and he found he found his text, wow. which is it's now almost is associated with Easter as the Easter portion of the Messiah. Right. Messiah right. by by Handel. So it's more and more the Resurrection Symphony is being performed at Easter time right. and with good reason. But it's such a brilliant idea. I mean, the first time I played this, performed this, I was actually in Atlanta with Robert Shaw. But I, it just blew my mind that he came to the end of this journey and, and the first expression of the idea that 
of resurrection, of life mm -hmm. after this life, was intoned by the chorus in a whisper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. It's hair raising. It isn't? is. You might, now, we would do yeah. this in New York, there'd be 200 people behind us. Yeah. And so, what they sing in, in, in German, oh, or whatever, and, and it, it means stand up. Yeah. Stand Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. It's incredible. <laughs> incredible. Incredible. I mean, it always, the hair stood on the Absolutely. Back of the and then, well, in, in, in this, Bernstein, of course, devoted his life in many important, serious respects to the music of Mahler. So it was very personal for him mm -hmm. to be doing this particular piece the year before he died. Now, of course, he didn't know he was going to die, right. but he was, in fact, it was. Right. And he had been away from the podium for a while. So right. I remember at the dress rehearsal Thursday morning, because we, we would play each program four times, dress rehearsal Thursday morning, first reviewed performance would be Thursday night, and then we'd play Friday, Saturday, and Tuesday. Well, Thursday morning, <clears throat> we started the piece, and this happens sometimes, and I think it might happen in every with every collaborative group that everybody is just at the top of their form and they begin to inspire each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, from the very beginning, there seemed to be something special about what well, there should have been a rehearsal, but we never stopped. We didn't stop. We performed the piece for ourselves. Amazing. Completely. And we knew after a few minutes that that's what was going to happen. We weren't going to break the spell and try to fix some little thing that might have not been perfect because it right. probably wasn't about as perfect as it's ever been. Right. You know, and so at the end of this, and, and at the very end of the piece, everybody, the choral forces and all the orchestra are shouting, stand wow. up. Wow. It may have been yeah. whispered in as an yeah. intimation in the, in the first time it's heard, but at the end, yep. You know, the roof comes off and the yeah. gates of heaven open. Yeah. People. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's a powerful, it's a powerful. Well, we were all dumbstruck, I would say, or the weep at women in the orchestra with tears coming down their cheek. And so we stopped, of course, early, I would say, just because it just took maybe an hour and a half to do it. And Bernstein said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we have a life in music. I'll see you tonight. Well, I, I had to speak to a group of uh, patrons at, before the concert at a little cocktail party uh, or dinner party or something. And I said, I know, ladies, <laughs> there were maybe 50 people. I said, I, I know it's very presumptuous to say it, but I think... This orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, has Mahler in its genes, mm -hmm. maybe more than any other, even than Vienna uh, uh, and where Mahler lived and worked. So I said, I think it's possible that you will hear tonight the greatest performance of this work that ever happened. Now, that's what's mm -hmm. very hard, of course, as a matter of judgment to Absolutely. defend, but that was... Uh, 25 years ago or 28 years ago or something, let me think about it, what, 1989? I have to take my math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Very I meet nice. people all the time who were there wow. who say the same thing. They say, it, it. As if, you know, I, I was there when Hank Aaron hit that home run. Right, uh, right. I, I, I was there that for moment. that at that moment. I was there for those concerts with Leonard Bernstein. I heard that. And the, <gasps> so... It changed it's lives. Incredible. It, it does. changed lives. And you never forget it and you always look to find a way to find that feeling again because there's nothing like that. Right. Right. Well I would say that that I had a That's few incredible. of those, but that probably was the number one, you know. That's incredible. Number, yeah. Was there a musician as you were a young student and going through maybe not an oboist, but someone that you listened to that could create that kind of inspiration for you? Was there any concerts that you would go to or somebody that you would look to to, to hear? I grew up, you know, in the era of uh, LPs mm -hmm. and uh, discs and and uh, I collected it little by little. Actually, I had an aunt who was more uh, kind of world-traveled and sophisticated, and so she brought me my first ever classical recording, 
which was uh, actually the, the Nutcracker Suite by Tchaikovsky, yeah. played by the Philadelphia Orchestra, conducted by Leopold Stokowski, Stokowski. <laughs> with whom I got to play in Atlanta one time. Amazing. Yeah. Um, but that began, and then uh, my parents bought me a little, uh, I said it looked like a little sewing machine or something. It was, a, you know, one of these little, uh, well, a record player kind of thing. It had its speakers in it. So I got two recordings when I got that uh, record player, you know. And they were both, it turns out, uh, well, one was Scheherazade. Rensky, of course, got his great colorful showpiece. Uh, that was conducted by uh, Bernstein. It was the New York Philharmonic. The other one was Brahms' Fourth Symphony, conducted by Bruno Walter, mm. who knew Brahms, and also with the New York Philharmonic. Now, <clears throat> I would go to bed, you know, uh, my junior year in high school, 16 years old, and put those records on and mm -hmm. fall asleep to them, or you know, it took, usually I'd get he listened to all of them, yeah. but I like a lot. Like I certainly got that stuff in my bloodstream, mm -hmm. so much of that for my my high school year, late high school years. And anyway, Brahms was my favorite composer, and I couldn't wait to find something else that he wrote. And so I bought a it was this disc was with Arthur Rubinstein playing mm -hmm. Brahms. And I'm telling you, I about wore that out. And he, for many years, was my favorite pianist. But I think uh, for young people who might be listening to this, some might know it, others might not know it by their own experience. But the, it's a case of affection arising from familiarity, mm -hmm. which simply requires some patience in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I didn't always get the message uh, when I got Brahms' second symphony. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> I think I like the fourth better. But, uh, you know, after yeah. a while, I thought, well, I love it just as much. Yeah. So that, that's part of what is necessary, I think, in case one feels a little bit uh, intimidated or or may feel well I don't I don't think this is for me um, and I can say it about myself because frankly I haven't paid the price to appreciate um, jazz and, and some other forms of music as much as other mm -hmm. people do but right. I just haven't uh, invested in it right. you have to you go have to really and commit to experience that I mean so it's a little bit like to to each his own. I mean, I don't mean to. My if I lay claim to some superiority in, uh, the, you know, harmonic class or Western classical music in it, its highest expressions, like being Beethoven, Mozart, J.S. Bach, uh, it's probably a little ignorant on my part. Well, it's where Bias the love is. Bias usually is, it's let's where the love face is. it, right? Absolutely. So. Well, let's, before we run out of time, I want to hear about Tabuto and how you met him and just some of the influences that you got to experience with him because were you his last student? Or one of just his about, last? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's an amazing time yeah. to slide in. Yeah. Well, Marcel Tabuto was known to me uh, in Lenore, North Carolina, because the instruments that Captain Harper bought for the band came from the uh, Hans Manig, who was the most important woodwind repairman in, in the country. Absolutely. And he, he was the man who took care of Tabuteau and all those great musicians of the Philadelphia Orchestra, all the woodwind players. So... We Captain Harper had bought 32 buffet clarinets for many. We probably the best customer he ever had. <laughs> the ultimate outfitted school. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, Haynes flutes, buffet wow. clarinets. You know, heckle bassoons, Loray Oh, my gosh. You no, know, we had the best of everything. And uh, that's when, of course, my teacher, as I say, had studied with a clarinetist in the Philadelphia Orchestra. So we were, and Tabuto had been the principal oboe for 39 years, um, he was with Toscanini at the Metropolitan Opera early in the 20th century, but then he stayed with the Philadelphia Orchestra as principal until 1953. And so he left to, he, was, he retired to France about the time uh, I began to play the oboe. I walked in 
I said, okay, I'll trade my alto sax for an oboe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, every I would say by the middle of the 20th century, every important oboe position in America was held by a student of Marcel Tabuto mm-hmm. or a student of, of, of a student. So... Um, you know, even from the, my, that remote perch, I was very much aware of uh, Marcel Tabuteau, and I knew he'd retired and gone back to France. So, anyway, I should just interject this part again because some people, young people, may have a similar experience of if they don't have the apprehension themselves, their parents do, that their pursuit of an instrumental uh, career is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, No sure thing that people are going to be able to uh, get paid enough for playing to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. And my parents certainly had that feeling. My father was a practical man who uh, said, son, at one time when I was 16, he called me over, son, he said, this oboe thing is like religion. Don't go off the deep end. (laughs) (laughs) And he was trying to protect me uh, from what he thought might be, um, you know, reckless, uh, dangerous kind of lifestyle. But uh, That's right. I- I- anyway, to I uh, I was concerned about that. I mean, I, I would I would say I was not thwarted by my parents, but certainly uh, taught uh, some apprehension about uh, you know practical concern about career. Potential. So I, I went to, instead of conservatory, as you know, I went to a liberal arts college and hedged my bets. So one would think, I think these days, it wasn't very much of a hedge to major in English and economics. <laughs> but at least the economics part reassured my father that it might have some kind of efficacy in the business <laughs> world. I yes. don't know. But it turns out, and that's, of course, one of the themes of this book I've written, that being an English major over and over again opened musical doors for me. Maybe most importantly, the door to the apartment of Marcel Tabuteau in Nice, where he had gone in retirement. And I give myself some credit for writing a persuasive note, but but mainly, but but the accident, one might say providential uh, impulse, to say in a note when... I left it at his apartment because he wasn't home. I said, Mr. Tabuteau, I am an English major from Davidson College in Europe on a Fulbright, and I play the oboe. I would like to come back at 8 o'clock tonight just to shake your hand. Well, of course, I mean, I, I, it made sense after all, after he was the god of the oboe, it made sense to go to the trouble to find it where he lived and knock on the door. I mean, it took some courage, too. But, of course, I showed up, I just guessed 8 o'clock because in Lenore, North Carolina, that would be before an old man's bedtime and after supper. I figured I hit it right. But, in fact, he'd spent the afternoon cooking for me. And uh, when I <laughs> when I showed up the, at, that night, it, uh, the table was set behind him, and, and uh, you know, I, I did just stuffed myself at a restaurant in Nice already, and if I hadn't had a companion who had to share my portion, I think uh, it would have exploded. <laughs> it would have been it. But what an incredible generosity, though! To welcome oh, a well, stranger he's in. Like, oh, this is a young man, as he must be, has come. Well, it, it it was a little bit out of sync, sure enough, that he would have gone to all that trouble and and set out this laid out this elegant table. His wife was still fussing around getting everything in order. But um, the, 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 what the magic in the message was that it was an English major. That's what happened. That he said, even though he'd mostly turned away students from conservatories like Juilliard and Eastman, Curtis, for, and, and was re, had retired in rather solitary bitterness because he was forced out of the Philadelphia Orchestra by what became the Supreme Court later said was illegal, which was mandatory retirement at right. age 65. Um, something Ormandy wanted, or he would right. never have gained control of his own orchestra. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Tabuto had not been teaching, and 
But he did have one piece of unfinished business, and this is the way he put it. He said, I have, to, I have one thing I have to do before I play my audition with St. Peter. I have to produce mm -hmm. a method book. I need to codify and preserve my own perspective about oboe playing. And those principles that he had taught that served his own students so well that Absolutely. they completely dominated, as I say, the, mm -hmm. the uh, music world in the United States. So d there is still an American school, so-called American school of oboe playing, which is in Tabuto's image. Mm -hmm. And so far, as I know, violated only once in my career lifetime, and that's when a Spanish oboist became principal oboe of the L.A. Philharmonic last right. year. Right. Uh, we're waiting to see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's the most important door, I think, that was opened by my being an English major. Absolutely. And uh, one never knows. I mean, I think he didn't tell me until I came back to study with him in the summer that that's the reason he agreed to teach me in exchange for a bottle of scotch. Okay, now, these yeah. were five weeks of lessons with, you know, I mean, it was priceless. Absolutely. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't have bought it. Absolutely. And, uh, anyway, I have a letter he wrote two weeks before he died in 1966, in which he said, if you come back to France and help me with my method book, I promise you will join the club of my star pupils. Aww. Amazing. So I, I feel that even though my time with him was very short compared to that of people who went to Curtis and right. studied four years and what, I got the good stuff, and he made a point of branding that into my backside painfully <laughs> yeah. with, with what he called the old school. In fact, one, I have to say now if I've thought about it uh, so much in retrospect that I don't think anyone ever spoke to me as abusive <laughs> as he did. He really did. I mean, I was in tears one afternoon, and he finally had an impulse of compassion. And he said, he said, listen, Robinson, consider all the little mollusks in the sea, how they writhe and squirm from the invading grains of sand. A few of them make pearls. It's up to you to make a pearl. I'm not going to withhold the irritant. It's beautiful. It's so true. Well, and he continued grinding me under like, his heel. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Through the tears. Yeah, I don't know if I can make a pearl, or I don't know if I ever actually did. Did, but I, I was willing. I took it because I realized the things he was revealing about the creative potential of playing an instrument or making music. The creative potential, and it was infinite. After all, most young players think uh, they deal with the athletic part. Right. Let's play the notes and put them in the right place. Mm -hmm. and, and if they sound good, so much the better. Yep. If they're pretty and in tune, great. Well, that's, of course, like Tabuto made perfectly clear that after a while, inescapably clear, that that's just the beginning. That once you have the notes, you, you must... That's like having a blueprint. You must build the house. Right. Now you have to say something. And then what you do with them is the important part. Mm -hmm. So, of course, some of you know that textbooks considering aesthetics have generally said that the composer is creative and the performer is interpretive. Mm -hmm. I mean, are basically interpretive artists is just supposed to express what the composer has written as if that's some kind of fixed product. Mm -hmm. In fact, when as Tabuto said, you can never outlive the potential of a solo in a Brahms symphony because you can change the shape, the color, the trajectory, the texture, the, imp the rhythmic pulse. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many things that can be done that you can never in fact express it precisely twice the same way. And I would say, as much as I played the orchestra, there were many of those wonderful solos that never, that I never played quite the way I aspired to play them. Mm -hmm. Which, frankly, instead of being intimidating, was th thrilling to me. Absolutely, it's Didn't a never-ending journey. You can, can, it's a an infinity pool. You can always know that there's more. That's you're right. You're never afraid that you're going to get to the end. And now what? <laughs> well, I'll dramatize that because I know we got about two minutes. So. When I finally came to 
France with my elbow in July of 1963 and I had to play for Tabutou. Of course, I was terrified. And my mouth was so dry I could hardly wet a reed. But to thank goodness, and, and you know, he was very um, indulgent and he kept sort of feeding out rope or something and he'd say, well, that sounds better than I thought. And <laughs> do you know this one little solo? And, and he would play and I would play a little. And so gradually... You know, my blood pressure went down, and I thought, I'm going to survive this. And after about an hour and a half, I think, he said, okay, that's enough for the first day, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Come early. Well, by then, uh, it's hard to believe, but I remember vividly the feeling of being let down because I thought, my gosh, I mean, I came out of this unscathed. I know yeah. I, I'm not that good. And, yeah. and if this is if this is the all there is if her oboe, it didn't amount to anything. And on the way out the door, I, I asked him. I said, "Mr. Tabuto, could I bring the Mozart Oboe Quartet when I see you next?" And because I had to play it in October that fall. And he, his eyes narrowed to slits, and he purred, you know, yes, yes, good idea, bring Mozart, come early. <laughs> and then when I showed up the next morning, and he was out on the, his balcony, gouging cane, getting ready to make reeds as usual, uh, I came out, spectacular place like Bellingham, and then uh, the sun was gleaming off the Mediterranean, and I said, good morning, Mr. Tabuto, and he didn't speak. He just kept on with this little planing tool, click, 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 it went in his lap. So I tried again. I said, how are you today? No, no answer. I thought, oh, the old man had a bad night. <laughs> he was 76. I had already been told that's how he was age. Anyway, I just stood there trying to absorb, you know, uh, not, not knowing what to do. The silence, I said, was quite thick at that moment he turned around he said Robinson you are a very sick oboe player <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around gouged Cain a little and I just stood there thinking mm, to try to take absorb that body blow and then, <laughs> then he looked around over his left shoulder and it, with a, this time a little twinkle in his eye and he said well I think I know the cure <laughs> but you're not going to like it <laughs> And so it begins. And so it began. <laughs> and so it began. And he t I, I said, you know, I, I was I think this is kind of the high point of the book in a way, that I really think my reaction was the most macho of my life when I said, Mr. Tabuto, I can take it. <laughs> and he said, no, I'll take it. <laughs> and he took my oboe and my, my Mozart music and put them on the back of his reed desk and scraped out the end of a little tube of oboe cane into which he put my reed and he's handed it back and he said now this is your this is your instrument you're going to play the tube awesome we're starting at the beginning this is no keys for you it doesn't get more beginning <laughs> no no way peep 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 <laughs> on a little reed on a tube of cane amazing so the whole thing about that was i guess it's the way the oboe must have started you know thousands of years ago when somebody made some grass buzz and mm -hmm. said hey i can mm -hmm. make a tone out of this mm -hmm. so i'm peeping under a palm tree in nice <laughs> one two three four five four three two one uh -huh. just dynamically yep. yeah trying to keep those little peepy things nice sounding the same <laughs> Yeah, one one had to be the same on both sides of the center. Three Love was it. to two, as two was to one, all this. So for hours, I peeped on a tube of cane. People passing by the International Academy in Nice must have thought it was the Looney Band. Mm -hmm. I sat under that palm tree shirtless and peeped on a tube <laughs> of cane. It's like little bird sounds coming out of that garden. Yeah. And a principal was born. That's when it began. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I guess it was. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. That was stellar. Oh, I, well, thank you. I You're just doing a great thing here. really, really enjoy hearing all of the adventures. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Be sure to check the Inside the Notes Facebook page for details on our next guest.